Note the location on this map of Horn's Reef, Horn's Reef, and of Wilhelmshaven. These are the British admirals. Admiral Sir John Jellicoe and Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty. Jellicoe was the commander in chief and Beatty commanded the battle cruiser fleet. They hated each other. Jellicoe was very much in the authoritarian mode. Um, although he had been in the Navy since he was 13, got on really well with all the crews, but really liked to command in detail. And Beatty considered himself more in the Nelsonian mode, except he was more slapdash. You can tell that by the sort of jaunty way he's wearing his hat. He was married to a very rich American. These are their ships, HMS Iron Dew and HMS Lion. And we're going to hear more about these ships later. These are the German admirals, Admiral Reinhard Scheer. He was a fleet commander. He came from Hanover. He was a uh, torpedo expert primarily, but also he was excelled at gunnery. And then you've got uh, Vice Admiral Fritz von Ritter von Hipper. Uh, he came from Bayern, Bavaria, um, actually from a middle class background. And he was an expert in gunnery. The German fleet was split up pretty much like the British fleet with battle cruisers and, and battleships. Uh, essentially, all the fleets at that time just copied what the British did. And these are their ships. Sein Majestät Schiff, Frederick de Grosse, and SMS Lutzow. Oh, these are the two fleets that ended up entangling with each other. And you can see this is a significant number of ships. I mean, it's 250 major, major fighting craft. 28 battleships against 16, the British and, and German, nine battle cruisers against five battle cruisers, eight armored cruisers against six pre-dreadnoughts. That's the, that's, that's be, means they were made before 1906. 26 light cruisers against 11, and 78 destroyers against 61 destroyers. They just happened to call them torpedo boats. One of the interesting aspects about this, and there's many interesting aspects about this campaign, is this is the first use of aircraft um, in any sea action. Uh, the seaplane carrier, you can see there, HMS Engadine, actually deployed her, her little um, seaplane, and the seaplane did spot, spot the German fleet. Unfortunately, the radio wasn't working very well, uh, so they didn't get the information back until they landed. Each side's intentions. The German high seas fleet was planning to lure out and trap a portion of the Grand Fleet, that is the battle cruisers from Rosyth, and break the British blockade of Germany. So Hipper was going to sail, try and encourage Beatty to come out, and then, and then encourage him to sail straight into the Grand Fleet and be destroyed. You know, it could be argued that the failure of the Germans to break the British blockade, because after all, the British did achieve their strategic goal of keeping the German fleet bottled up in Wilhelmshaven. You could argue it cost them the war. The German high seas fleet would not venture out again as a single entity until they did so to scuttle their fleet in Scarpa Flow at the end of the war. One month after Jutland, the British Grand Fleet was stronger than it had been before sailing to Jutland. And Scheer realized that any further activity against the British Grand Fleet would be unwise. The Germans abandoned their strategy of forays into the North Sea, switching tactics to unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic, which helped bring the US into the war on the Allied side. There were many important lessons to be learned, and I'm quite happy in questions to answer questions on why these ships blew up and what the British were doing wrong. But the most important and the most difficult to realize at this time was this was the very last battle in naval history where battleships ruled. It was the first to involve any form of aircraft, which would later on to go and rule the seas with their aircraft carriers along with submarines and torpedoes. This battle marked the end of an era. The British were concerned. They, they felt that they were sneaking round to trap um, Shia. 
Okay, so for them, it was a night sneaky operation. You know, if we sneak down here, we can cut him off, right? We, but what we don't want to do is to let Shia know where we are. So the British captains on the battleships, not the little destroyers who were in the, in the great melee, uh, declined to open fire unless they were ordered to do so. Now the argument goes that if this was in Nelsonian times, they would have just shot the crap out of the Germans as, at night. And, um, and, I, and I'm sure that would have happened. There is a disadvantage, however, with having your captains doing what they like. And the British got themselves into trouble a number of times by captains going out and doing things that were entirely inappropriate and causing major international incidents because they went and seized ships when they uh, you know, perhaps shouldn't have done. Uh, but that was the reason. They, they thought they were going to give their position away so they didn't fire. Now, to me, there's little logic in that because you've got, <laughs> you've got 50 or 60 destroyers you know, throwing themselves headlong, firing their little six-inch guns, and, and crashing into German battleships, you know, you would have thought that, you know, the big guys would have come to their aid, at their, you know, their aid and helped them out. It's a, it's a real conundrum, I can tell you. This battle is uh, debated hotly in the UK as to how it should have gone. And of course, it's always easy in hindsight. It was like Beatty chasing after a hipper and leaving the battleships behind, you know, and I, I saw in the Falkland Islands, uh, you know, battalion commanders who had never really been in battle other than just counter-revolutionary war in Northern Ireland, counter-insurgency operations, you know, just go charging off into battle and, you know, without really getting their act together and getting the right fire support and ending up in a lot of trouble and, and, and getting themselves killed. You know, you only do that once. And then you realize, hang on, I've really got to think about this and get the right sort of fire support and do things properly. So I can understand Beatty in his urgency going after Hipper. What I can't understand is why Malaya and other members of the 5th Battle Squadron, this powerful force, didn't open fire at night. Because if you actually look at the percentage of ships lost, Although it looks awful when we put up this chart, actually the Germans lost a larger percentage of their fleet than the British did. And you know, quantity is its own form of quality, as we used to say about the Russians, you know. And, and the British were still in a very strong position at the end of this campaign. They were just really and the population was really upset and disappointed that they hadn't had a second Trafalgar, which is what they felt they should have done. And you know what they should have done, too. I mean, you've seen here, there were two completely separate times in this campaign when the British should have blown the Germans out of the water. The first one was, if that fifth battle squadron had been with Beatty, Hipper would have been destroyed. His entire fleet would have been destroyed if he had come into contact with those Queen Elizabeth-class battleships right at the start, which is what should have happened. And the other one was clearly when Jellicoe had the visibility in his favor, he had crossed the T twice, and then he turned away. So this was a battle the British could have won. I cannot see any circumstances under which the Germans could have won this battle, which is why they ran away. I mean, it was a brilliant piece of seamanship by Shear and Hipper. Tremendous. And to do what they did at night, the pounding that they took, and, you know, I mean, I mean, look at that ship. I mean, there's not much less of it. It just happens to be floating. But it's not operational anymore. And it never, ever went out again until at the end of the war, the entire German fleet had to sail up to Scarpa Flow and scuttle themselves. So... It's, uh, it's just one of those very unsatisfactory battles that, you know, the Germans definitely did better in terms of the tactical results, but strategically they were in trouble. They starved. I mean, the, the, 
the German army was actually never defeated on the battlefield. And this was part of the myth that Hitler built up. I'll be in just one moment. And, and the reason for that was because the British were able to maintain this blockade. They starved the German nation. They starved the German, German army. The German army actually mutinied. In fact, if you, if you ignore the US uh, army, which deployed after all in 1917, if you look at all the forces that started the First World War, every single army that took part in the First World War from the start mutinied, except the British, every one. The Russians ended up in a revolution. And, and their government fell. The French mutinied and the Germans mutinied. And that was because of the blockade. They had no food, they, had, they, they couldn't supply their army, and they mutinied. The Jutland campaign, or this, this battle, actually won the First World War for the Allies. Because they were able to maintain the blockade. If the Germans had been able to break it, who knows what would have happened? And the fact that unrestricted warfare was the trigger to bring the US into the war, because they were going out there and sinking US ships. Uh, uh, Lusitania? Mm, exactly, Lusitania, another one. I mean, playing right into the hand of the propagandists. And the Americans came into the war, which was you know, the, the final straw that broke, broke the camel's back. But really, the camel's back was broken by the by the Royal Naval Blockade of mainland Europe. So it was a strategic victory, absolutely it was. 